Good morning and welcome to worship. Today Molly and I are at the Reed Park and we look forward to sharing in worship with you on this All Saints Sunday. Come, worship with us. We sing for all the saints. Let's pray. We come to you, God of the living, God of new beginnings, God of resurrection's glory. In you we find life and hope and joy. Thank you, loving God, for being in our lives, for giving us all that we have and making us all that we are. Though we know that you are a bit of a mystery, though we do not completely understand you, we are grateful that you have made sure that we know one thing, the most important thing, that you love us now 
and for always. Help us to accept this gift, to use it today and all the days of our lives, to make them and everyone else's lives better. Amen. Today's reading from Luke's Gospel isn't an easy one. And to be honest, I swithered for a good few days this week as to whether we should have this one or I should just choose something else. But Jesus is talking about death and heaven. And I think on All Saints it's kind of important to think about these things. Because what Jesus is trying to say to the Sadducees is you can make all kinds of questions and ponderings and big ideas about things but the reality is that when someone dies we now know through Christ that they go to live in heaven which is being surrounded in love and connectedness in sheer joy for the rest of their existence how they will be in that existence we don't know how they will appear when we meet again, we don't know. But we know that they will be free of pain, living in love and happiness. And when we meet again in heaven, it won't matter whether it's a first marriage, a second marriage, a third or fourth marriage. It won't matter whether they were your auntie, sister's cousin's friend, because actually what matters most is that they are held in God's love now and forever, as will you be. We hear from scripture. Some of the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to Jesus with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers. The first one married a woman and died childless. The second, and then the third, married her. And in the same way, the seven died, leaving no children. Finally, the woman died too. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be, since the seven were married to her? Jesus replied, the people of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy of taking part in the age to come and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage. And they can no longer die, for they are like the angels. They are God's children, since they are children of the resurrection. But in the account of the burning bush, even Moses showed that the dead rise, for he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for to him all are alive. Some of the teachers of the law responded, Well said, teacher. And no one dared to ask him any more questions. We sing together. Thinking of those who've gone before, ye servants of God, your master proclaim.
there's a famous phrase that says, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin? The historical origins of the question aren't exactly clear, but the traditional explanation is that it emerges from centuries old theological debate. The apparent absurdity of the question is part of the point. Because you could argue, well, if angels are spiritual and don't have a body, then the answer is infinite. But if angels have bodies, then how many bodies could you fit on the head of a... But does it matter? Why does it matter? Why is it relevant? Why would I even need to know this? Who even cares? The same kind of goes with some of the questions we ask in life. Like Batman or Superman, who would win in a fight? Scones, jam first, cream first. At face value, the question that Luke's passage opens with is precisely the kind of ridiculous, hypothetical question that you might expect while you're hanging out with your family or friends. And the bond of friendship, it often allows us to entertain frivolous, silly things for their own sake. Jammy Dodgers or Toffee Pops. Hmm. Who doesn't need a bit of silliness in their lives? But the Sadducees are not close personal friends of Jesus. They're not companions around a campfire having a bit of banter. They're political, religious influencers and they're sceptical about Jesus and his provocative ministry. Now, we need to be clear not to make blanket assertions about Sadducees, Pharisees, any of the Jewish religious and political groups, because this subset of interrogators invite us to consider the underlying conditions. The whole of Luke chapter 20 is about contentious encounters between Jesus and the leaders in the temple. And the setting is important because it represents that seat of moral and spiritual authority. And for Jesus to command a hearing, for Jesus to command an audience in this space meant something because it meant that he had rapport with everyday people and that was strong enough to gather a crowd. He commanded respect by virtue, not by his ability to communicate with great wisdom and integrity. And the ongoing questions throughout the whole of chapter 20 that are presented to Jesus are direct attempts to undermine his credibility in front of his followers. So the, the layers of dialogue here are telling. Because first we hear that this group of Sadducees do not believe in resurrection. Now, Jewish people at that time believed in a bodily resurrection at the end of time. And that sets them at odds. Not only with Jesus, but with the Pharisees and many of the other leaders at the temple. So you've got to remember there's like a bigger issue at play here. And so the Sadducees in this case, appeal to the law of Moses that's written in the Torah. And the insinuation is that their question is validated on those grounds. But then they can't actually recite the laws. And it's a setup for an elaborate scenario that's meant to force Jesus into compromising himself in front of people. The Sadducees' question reveals two things. First is their ability to find a really tricky theological question that could catch them out. And the second, well, the second is their inability to visualise something beyond the present interest. The line of inquiry is a matter of theoretical debate as opposed to ultimate concerns in life. And so Jesus' response is masterful the way he embraces the very prophet that the Sadducees revere, because he situates his message in the tradition of Moses, making a case that if God of their ancestors is the living God, then those ancestors are alive in and with the living God. And it underscores an attitude difference between the power and purpose of the law 
is it there to cause division or is it there to show love? Jesus shows profound respect for the law here. But what makes him subversive is not a rebellious dismissal of Jewish traditions and customs because he values them no less than his opponents do, but his actions in the passage and throughout this chapter model a particular relationship to tradition. Because although he understands why things are the way they are, he understands the anxieties and the concerns of people. And he understands that death is the greatest mystery. What happens? Will we meet again? How? Will I recognise them in their heavenly form? Jesus says essentially that we won't, what won't be resurrected are the petty squabbles, the theoretical political quandaries of our time they'll be relegated to the things of the dead the past what matters is that we are loved we are loved here and now we are loved in the ever after we will be held in love and the rest jesus says is a mystery but if we can hold on to the fact that god loves us and God has promised to always love us, even until the end of time, then yes, we will be held in love for eternity. And whether you are desperately looking forward to meeting people in heaven that you have loved and lost, or are concerned that there are people in heaven that you don't want to see again, actually, it's like angels on the pin doesn't matter because what matters is that heaven is a place free of pain free of sadness free of anxiousness free of heart and full of love you will be filled with love and therefore none of that really matters because God loves you now and always we're going to sing about the mystery of God. God, you sometimes speak in wonders. for others. Let's pray together for others. Let us pray. Loving God, out of darkness you bring light. Out of despair you bring hope. Out of fear you bring joy. Out of death you bring life, mysterious, glorious and eternal. Be with us now. Hear us as we pray for others and ourselves. And as we remember those who are in your nearer presence and the impact they had on our lives and that we will meet again. 
as the seasons progress, as the autumn cool breezes blow through the northern part of the world and spring's joyful light dances on the southern part, we remember and pray for your whole world. Help all people, in all places, to give thanks for the gift of life, not only our own but that of all living things, of animals and plants, and guide us to the resolve to do better. Do be better in our calling as stewards of your wonderful creation. As we, your beloved children, continue to seek to find new ways to bring mission to the world, a world so in need of hope, we pray for this church and for all churches as they seek to find their place in a changed and changing world. Help us all to remain faithful to your calling, to place the needs of others above our own, to have the boldness to tell the hard truths. As our community and society struggles with inequality, fear, poverty, disease, we pray for ourselves and all those with the power to bring about justice and change, that we and they will find strength in you to work for the good of all people. As we each consider our lives, our own relationships, our own hopes and dreams, we pray that you'll be with us through it all. Loving God, we will know your presence, your care, your unending love through Jesus our Saviour. For they ask this in the name of Jesus our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. As you can see, I'm full of the cold. But we sing together in joy and celebration of a God who loves us now and always. There is a Redeemer. There is a Redeemer. There is a Redeemer. Jesus, God's own Son. Precious Lamb of God, Messiah.
thank you for joining us for worship. It's not easy to think about death, but on All Saints, it gives us an opportunity to remember that those that we have loved and lost are not lost because they're with God, closer to him in love, and we will meet again one day. Until we meet again in person, in the church or online, have a good week and may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you and those whom you love, today and always. Amen. <laughs>